tonight, the title is Mysterious. That's a Greek word for mystery. So we are going to think about mysteries tonight. There's a book called Unveiling the Mysteries of the Bible, and the description of the book says, the Bible is certainly the most mysterious book ever created. The scriptures are filled with hundreds of curious passages that have puzzled both Jews and Christians for thousands of years. And this book covers topics such as the 10 plagues of Exodus, the fall of the walls of Jericho. How did that happen? Jonah and the great fish. It puts the virgin birth and the star of Bethlehem in the category of mysteries. I understand why. Um, there's some really profound mysteries that I think about sometimes. Like, what was Noah's wife's name? <laughs> that doesn't matter. It's a good thing. We don't need to know that. Well, these things are in the category of being mysteries because we don't know the answers to them. And there are mysteries ahead of us. When will rapture happen? Who will the Antichrist be? What will our new glorious bodies be like? What is that new heaven going to look like? What's the new earth going to look like? One day we will see and know and experience the answer to these questions. But they are mysteries to us right now. On your handout, I have given you Mysterion. And I'm going to give you first the English definition for this word from Webster's Dictionary. It's a profound secret, something wholly unknown, or something kept cautiously concealed, and therefore exciting curiosity or wonder. The Bible mysteries that I have just mentioned are, according to the English definition of the word, things that are wholly unknown. They excite curiosity and wonder. We wonder, what kind of fish swallowed Jonah? <laughs> the man who wrote the English dictionary was Mr. Noah Webster, and he was an extremely intelligent man, as well as a man of faith and a student of the Bible. I've given you his first definition, number one, but I want to share with you what he included in the dictionary, these other two definitions. Number two, in religion. It is anything in the character or attributes of God or in the economy of divine providence which is not revealed to man. So that which God has not disclosed. And then his third definition was that which is beyond human comprehension until explained. And in this sense, mystery often conveys the idea of something awfully sublime or important something that excites wonder. Those two definitions, the second and third, come a little closer to the meaning of the Greek word for mystery, which you looked up in your homework, homework, mysterion. Mysterion is used 27 times in the New Testament. And I am going to give you a few more fill in the blanks here. Um, well, I don't think this one is going to. I'm going to give you a slide, and there are not any blanks on your handout for it. Mysterion is from mustace, that's a noun, and that is one initiated into mysteries. But that word is derived from mueo, which means to initiate, which is also derived from muo, which is to close the lips or eyes. So you can see how this would make something mysterious if I can't see it or if I'm not supposed to talk about it. Mysterion means a secret imparted only to the initiated. What is unknown until it's revealed, whether it be easy or hard to understand. And this concept, the understanding of mystery this way, was well known and understood by the Ephesians. They were Greeks. And in the Greek religion, which would have been practiced at the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus, this religion was based on what they called divine mysteries. Specially appointed priests, carefully prepared individuals through stages of initiation, instruction, and secret revelation. The enlightened were then joined with the divine and could receive healing, success, and immortality. 
the mysteries was a special term for the secret rites and celebrations in ancient religions. So just this word would have made them think of those special religious practices and disclosings as they became a part of that cult. Paul used the Greek word mysterion six times in the book of Ephesians, and that's more than it's used in any other book in the Bible. The Greek Ephesians, now believers, would have had a background in divine mysteries. Ephesians is a book of mysteries. It's a book that's full of secrets that are imparted to those that are initiated in Christ. It's, Ephesians is a book that is full of things that were once unknown, but now are revealed. And some things are easy to understand and some things are hard to understand. When Paul spoke to the Ephesian Greeks about mysteries, their frame of reference would have been the secret rituals and the special initiations that they once were either included in or excluded from. I mean, that's part of the mystery and the secret as well, to be excluded. But now, remember what he said, they are accepted in the beloved. And the mysteries of the Lord were being revealed to them without any need for secret rituals or special handshakes. That is good news. So as I'm talking about mysteries being revealed to those who are in Christ, we are saved by grace through faith. No works, no secret rituals, no handshakes, nothing like that. Warren Wiersbe says that in the New Testament, a mystery is a sacred secret that is unknown to unbelievers, but, is, but they are understood and treasured by the people of God. The mysteries so far in Ephesians that we have pondered have been election, death, grace, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And the main mystery that is explained in Ephesians is what we've been studying in our homework. The full gospel that Christ died for Jews and Gentiles. And that by grace through faith, Gentiles are made fellow heirs with Jews in Christ. But there's another mystery that runs through the letter to the Ephesians. It's a mystery that has been revealed yet it is still incomprehensible. There is a mystery that excites curiosity, a mystery that conveys the idea of something incredibly important, something that excites wonder and awe. I'm going to give you some big clues to what I'm talking about and see if you figure out what the other mystery is that I'm referring to. I'm going to read some verses from Ephesians, and the highlighted words are the clues. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Ephesians 1, 3. Ephesians 2, 18. Through Christ we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Ephesians 3, 14. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he would grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. I think you figured it out. The book of Ephesians is saturated with the concept of the mysterious Holy Trinity. The Trinity. This week, you looked at a passage that refers to the truth of the Trinity. You are members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. In our future studies, you're going to see the truth of the Trinity. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. These are huge 
concepts. You will also see Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, giving thanks to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So those are showing up throughout the book of Ephesians. But the scriptures that compelled me to consider the Trinity this week were the truths that when placed side by side boggle my mind. Ephesians 2.22, you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Ephesians 3.16, Paul prayed that God would grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, your inner man. Ephesians 3.17, that Christ, Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith. And Ephesians 3.19, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You are the temple of God. The Holy Spirit is in your inner man. Christ dwells in your hearts. You are filled with all the fullness of the Trinity. Like just, I mean, that just blows us away. Does it make your head spin? Can you comprehend it? I cannot. <laughs> but I love it anyway. And I'm thankful. I have been challenged by this book, The Forgotten Trinity. I'll mention it again. Um, but he challenges me and us to love the Trinity, to embrace the Trinity, and to defend the Trinity, to know the truth of it, because the Trinity is who God is. And we must worship him according to who he is. And if you ponder the Trinity, I know God does not change, but he gets bigger and bigger to us. This is that kind of doctrine. So today, I'm going to try to explain the mystery of the Trinity to you. I just laugh when I say that because, of course, I cannot explain it. I am going to present <laughs> the aspects of the mystery of the Trinity that have been revealed in Scripture. Um, as we pursue going deeper to, to just understand you know, the fringes of our understanding of the Trinity, we will be getting to know our God better. And we want to do that. And in the end, you will also see that the mystery of the Trinity is intricately related to the mystery of the gospel. You cannot have the gospel without the Trinity. And that means that the mystery in Ephesians that Jews and Gentiles are fellow heirs in Christ, that's because of the gospel. That mystery is because of the Trinity. So where do we start? This thing has been revealed, but it is still hard to understand. We're going to start just remembering the last verse that you studied last week. We are going to trust that we will be strengthened with might through the Holy Spirit in our inner man. And we're going to trust that the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. And we're going to trust that the Holy Spirit will give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and understanding in the knowledge of God. And the next step is to get a basic definition of the Trinity. So that's the next fill in the blank on your handout here. The Trinity. This is a basic definition from Wayne Grudem. God eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And each person is fully God and there is one God. This is the kind of thing that I feel like I need to say very slowly <laughs> because it is so deep. I have another definition of the Trinity from James White, the author of this book, The Forgotten Trinity. And 
He says the same thing, he just expresses it a little differently. Within, oh, here it is. Within the one being that is God, there exists eternally three co-equal and co-eternal persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are not three gods. I know you know that. But I still have to say it to make that very clear. And there are not three different manifestations of one God. That would not be the right way to explain this. Now, I have notes here, and I want to be careful that I don't try to explain something in my own words. I need to make sure I say it the way it's written <laughs> because it's very easy to to slip and slide and get messy with our explanations. So, just one more time. There is one God, and He eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each person is fully God. Your uh, first page of your handout shows three foundations upon which this definition is built. And I'm going to go ahead and give you those three, and then we will walk through those three foundations one at a time. The first is monotheism, and that is there is only one God. The second foundation is there are three divine persons. And then the fourth, uh, sorry, the third foundation is the persons are co-equal and co-eternal. So to say these three foundations, very simply, number one, there is one God. Number two, God is three persons. And number three, each person is fully God. Nodding. Those are short sentences using short words. Simple, right? <laughs> But you put it all together, and this concept is bigger than our little gray brain cells can comprehend fully. So we're going to look at some scriptures that teach us about the truths of the Trinity. And I have given you each foundation and blocks full of the whole verse there. And you can highlight things that you want to. I will not be reading through every single one of these verses. I'll just point some out. So the first foundation is that in Scripture we see there is only one God. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. In Isaiah 43, before me... I'm going to just go there. Before me, there was no other God formed, and there will be none after me. No other God. In the New Testament, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, there is one body, one spirit, one Lord. 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and men. So, the first foundation, we can cover that. We see those verses and we'll just stop with that one just like that. There is one God. The second foundation, in Scripture there are three divine persons who are recognized as God. The Father is recognized as God. The Son is recognized as God. The Holy Spirit is recognized as God. I mean, this is the truth. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And when we refer to members of the Trinity as persons, it indicates that there is a relationship between individual members of the Trinity. Relationship. That is always an important concept. In your handout, in the middle of the page, second foundation, first block there shows scriptures where it tells us that the Father is God. In Deuteronomy 32, 6, it says, Do you thus repay the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is not he your Father who has bought you? He has made you and established you. And there's a Hosea verse. And then there's a big Matthew passage. In this teaching from Jesus, he refers to, and I've underlined them for you, 
your heavenly father. And then he refers to God. And then he refers again to your heavenly father. And he uses these terms interchangeably. He's demonstrating that the father is God. And then if you turn to the next page in your handout, we're still looking at three divine persons. The son is God. John 1, 1 and 2. The word was with God and the word was God. And I should have put John 1, 14 in there because that tells us and the word became flesh. And that's, you know, Jesus was with God. Jesus was God. God is eternal. Jesus is God. So the son is God. And then we see what Thomas said in John 20, 28. He called Jesus my Lord and my God. Jesus did not rebuke him for this declaration. And that indicated it was true. Now let's look at verses that show us that the Holy Spirit is God. Acts 5, 1 through 4. Peter said to Ananias, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? And then a few sentences later, he says, you have not lied to men, but to God. Peter clearly believed that the Holy Spirit was God. I have, I'm saying it in past tense because Peter said it in past tense. But even when I say Peter believed the Holy Spirit was God, I feel like but the Holy Spirit is God. <laughs> so our language is so limited. It's very hard to communicate this truth with our language, our language and words and our understanding, everything about us falls so far short. Well, Paul also refers to the Holy Spirit as God. And this can be seen when comparing 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 and 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Yes, those are underlined also. In the first verse, he says, you are the temple of God. And in the second set of verses, he says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So scripture lays the foundation that there is one God, only one God. And yet it also states that the father is God, the son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Um, the author of this book, The Forgotten Trinity, says the single greatest indisputable testimony to the personality and deity of the Holy Spirit is found in his giving gifts to believers in the church. So we're going to study spiritual gifts when we get to it in Ephesians. But today we can look at 1 Corinthians 12, 4 and 11. You can see that last scripture in that block. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. One and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. This is fascinating. This shows us the Holy Spirit makes a determination that's what God does. He decides what he wants to do. The Holy Spirit gives the gifts, gives whichever gifts he wants to, to whomever he wants to. The Holy Spirit gives gifts as he wills. And that word is used in other passages to explain what Jesus wills to do or what God wills to do. Please remember the Holy Spirit is not a force, a power but a person. He is a he, not an it. So we've seen in the scripture that there are three divine persons who are recognized as God. And we also see that there are three persons who are distinguished from each other. And here's a picture to help us get a visual idea of the things that I've been talking about. They are distinguished. Any other concept is heresy. It is false doctrine to say that the father is the son or the son is the father or the spirit is the father. So on the outside, you see the circle. The father is not the spirit. The spirit is not the son. The son is not the spirit, but the father is God. The spirit is God. The son is God. Um, James White says, no true Trinitarian believes that the father was a ventriloquist at the baptism of Jesus or that Jesus was praying to himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is praying to his father. 
what we're talking about is one what and three who's, if that helps. <laughs> the one what is the being or essence of God. The being of God. I like that word better. <laughs> and the three who's are the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. You have Matthew eleven twenty seven on your handout showing um, this distinguishing person, one from another. The Father is distinguished from the Son. There are actions on the part of the Father and different actions on the part of the Son. And then at Luke 3.22, that's the passage verse from the baptism of Jesus. When all three persons of the Trinity are distinct. Jesus the man is there. The voice of the Father was heard. And the Holy Spirit descended as a dove. It's beautiful. And now we're going to go to the third foundation. The three divine persons are co-equal and co-eternal. All three are associated on equal footing as God. You can see these um, truths in the verses from Ephesians that are on your handout. Ephesians 2.18, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Ephesians 2, 20 through 22. I read this one earlier, and we've studied that one. Ephesians 3, 4 through 16. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man. And that goes on and on. That prayer, Jesus, that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith, You'll be filled up to all the fullness of God. And, um, oh, I do want to read this from Titus 3, 4 through 6, because equality in these three persons is shown here. We see God, our Savior, Jesus, our Savior, and the Father pouring out the Holy Spirit and regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. The three persons of the Trinity are are equal in our salvation. There is another aspect of this third foundation, and it is that the tripersonality of the Godhead is eternal and not merely temporal. So the three persons of the Godhead are eternal. The Trinity is seen in Scripture to have existed eternally. It did not develop at some point in time. The Godhead did not take on different forms at different times. God did not manifest himself as a different person at one time and then a different person at another time. For example, the Trinity did not just exist during the life of Christ on earth. Each member of the Godhead has existed eternally. That is very important to hold on to because there are heretical teachings even to this day that where some try to simplify the Trinity and have God in one form at one time and then he changes at a different time. So it's it takes away the eternality of each member of the Trinity. Let's look at the verses in the box here, beginning with John 1. Again, this states that the Son has existed eternally as God. <laughs> the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Philippians 2, 6, Jesus existed in the form of God. That's showing him to be equal with God. John 17, 24, says, you loved me before the foundation of the world. God loved Jesus before the foundation of the world. That's two distinct persons of the Godhead. Colossians 1, 16. For by him all things were created. Jesus could not have been created at some point in time, or he would have been a member of the all things that were created. But here, 
He's the one doing the creating. Genesis 1, 2 shows that the Holy Spirit was present at creation. And Hebrews 9, 14 states that the Holy Spirit is the eternal spirit. So once again, the definition of the Trinity is there is one God. God exists eternally as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each person is fully God. So I'm going to put this picture back up here for you to just keep pondering. The mystery of the Trinity was always true, as the mystery of salvation for the Gentiles was always true. The mystery of salvation for the Gentiles was revealed and explained and made clear through Paul. The mystery of the Trinity was revealed and explained and made clear through the coming of Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Trinity, that God is one being, and within that one being exists three persons. This was revealed when one of those persons came in the flesh, and then when another of the persons descended at Pentecost. The revelation began when the angel made an announcement to Mary, the Christmas story. The angel answered Mary and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. The Trinity was not revealed by a prophet, preacher, or apostle. The Trinity was not revealed through dreams or a revelation from God. The Trinity was revealed when God the Father sent God the Son to die on a cross for our sins. And then God the Son sent God the Spirit to give us life and live in us. And there's one more passage in Ephesians that I haven't mentioned yet, which summarizes the Trinity. We've already studied it. We know how important it is. It's a gospel passage. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, In Christ you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession. Whose purchased possession is it? It's God's purchased possession. And then we have this to the praise of his glory. His is a pronoun referring back to God that Paul had mentioned earlier before this verse. God the Father purchased us with the blood of God the Son, and we're sealed with God the Spirit until the day of redemption. The mystery of the gospel is based on the mystery of the Trinity. Think about this. What if Jesus were not God? He wouldn't have been the perfect sacrifice. If Jesus were a created being, how could he fully bear the whole wrath of God? And, and we, these are things, even he is God, and he did, and we still can't comprehend that. Religious leaders did not believe that Jesus was God, and they killed him because he claimed that he was what if Jesus was God and there was no father? Then nothing Jesus said would have been true. He was always talking about his father. We would be right to be skeptical and doubt his words, but we don't have to do that. What if the Holy Spirit were not God, the Spirit of God? Can you imagine anything less than the Holy Spirit of God controlling you, living you, dwelling in you. Would you want anything less than the perfect Spirit of God teaching you and comforting you? The truth of the gospel is based on the full truth of the Trinity, as mysterious as it is, as complex and incomprehensible as it is. Anything less, anything distorted leads to error, 
to perversion, to heresy, to cults. It makes God smaller than he is. It twists the truth. And the last page of your handout gives you a quick look at what some other religions and even other Christian denominations believe regarding the Trinity. So just very quickly, um, number one, Islam says that um, Christ is not God. His divinity is rejected. They believe in one God. Um, Hinduism says there are many gods. That rules out the Trinity right off the bat. Judaism says there is one God, but they think that Christians believe in three gods. So they see, uh, uh, they are counting. Um, they don't understand this doctrine of one God, three persons. Jehovah's Witnesses say Jesus is not one God, not with God the Father, not one with God the Father. They see that he was the first son that God brought forth. Not the way we talk about God bringing, like, the birth of Christ, that's not what they're talking about. He's a created being. Mormonism actually says in some of their writings, there are three gods separate in personality, united in purpose, in plan, and in all attributes of perfection. But they said there are three gods. So uh, their language sounds okay. They say, we believe in God, the eternal father, and in his son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. That sounds pretty good, but they're really talking. They know they're saying this is three separate gods. So that's not right. Christian scientists reject the Trinity. They view it as polytheism. And then I'm not even going to try to talk about the other things they believe because it is just so strange. Sorry, but um, I do want to mention Unitarianism. They say God is one essence, one person who may take on different forms in accordance with his plan. And this is what I was mentioning earlier, that God does not manifest himself in different persons at different times, but they say he does. And I do have some notes here. Oneness Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism. And apostolic churches, uh, we just have to be very careful as we are listening to how people are referring to God, the Trinity, and look at the rest of their teaching. Something's going to go wrong if they don't get the Trinity right. Each time that I've taught on the Trinity, someone comes up to me afterwards and gives me analogy like the Trinity is like, and there are good analogies, an apple has seed, fruit, peel, sounds like three in one, or an egg is the, uh, the egg yolk, the white, the shell, sounds like three in one. All analogies fall short of communicating the truth of the Trinity. But you know that I do like to try to give you some illustrations. And I knew this was a concept that would set our minds spinning. And I have this thing in my house that does some spinning and drawing. So it's Spirograph. Mm -hmm. I had my daughter work on this. And I have a little video of her using one circle. Um, there's a big circle. And she's drawing inside there to make a, so that will be an illustration of one. And it's this, she's using the same piece and she's just switching the holes and the, uh, the shape is the same shape, just different sizes. So it ends up making a different design. You're going to see all three designs in a minute. So right here, she's using the same color, using the same circle. And it's the same shape, but they're turning out differently. So there is a same, 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 but different, different, different going on. And she actually did those three things pretty well. Another thing about Spirograph is you think, oh, it's so easy, um, you know, simple. But when she puts it all together, okay, so that was the, there's the picture of the three. So they look, they're different, even though they're the same. <laughs> 
And now she's going to do different colors and um, same one little piece, but she messed up. Oops. <laughs> because when you start trying to put these three concepts together of who Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, um, it's, it's hard to make it all fit together. So I was like, even messing up, even having trouble doing this at the same time, um, the, the oops that she had every now and then, it's like, you know, we just can't understand the Trinity completely ourselves. But I've, she's used three different colors just so you could see what it looks like when it's one. She's having trouble again. <laughs> but she's still doing a very good job. Uh, so I'll let her draw that out, and you will see <laughs> the the one final illustration here. But there's a hole in it also. So this is just showing how finite we are and how hard it is for us to truly understand the Trinity. We have the facts before us, what God has told us. And I, do I have the, I wanted, oh, that's the final picture in case you didn't see it. All analogies fall short of communicating the truth of the Trinity. Even water, that's another one, has three forms, steam, water, and ice. But they're never all of that at the same time, right? And each one of these things is a created thing, right? The Trinity, is, you can't, God is unique. God is one. He is completely different from anything that we are and that we can talk about. There are many examples of three in one that exist in nature and that help us to consider that God is three in one. These are hints to his diversity in unity. I just think about that phrase, diversity in unity. That's what the body of Christ is. We who are many members are one in Christ. Jew and Gentile fellow heirs are one in Christ. Can we fully understand the Trinity? No. <laughs> I repeatedly saw that the doctrine of the Trinity is described as a mystery. We can understand these basic foundations, but we can't understand how it all fits together. Wayne Grudem says, it's spiritually healthy for us to acknowledge openly that God's very being is far greater than we can ever comprehend. This humbles us before God and draws us to worship him without revelation. <laughs> Reservation. We can worship him without the full revelation of the Trinity as well, right? So the Trinity is the tri-unity of God, unity and diversity. Just um, one more verse to share with you, which is the great Trinitarian passage. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The name of the Lord was held in highest reverence. So when Jesus mentions the name of the Lord, he is doing it accurately. Everyone would have known he is handling it appropriately. It is not to be blasphemed. Jesus clearly substituted the names of um, the persons of the Trinity for the name of the Lord God. Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And also, the word, yes, the word, name, is singular in the Greek. It is not plural. In the one name of our one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May your understanding of the mystery of your great God be based on his revelation of who he is, three in one. And may your understanding of the gospel be based on his revelation of who he is. God the Father sent God the Son and sealed you with God the Spirit. This gives us so much to be thankful for. So I'll just close with the doxology 
we have seen it before, but it's so appropriate to just uh, state it again. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Please pray with me. Lord God, we bow before you, and it is hard to have words to speak to you right now, to praise you for all that you are. We do praise you and worship you as the one God, the one true God, the living God. You are God above all, and you are great in every way and we bow before you and worship you and acknowledge you as our father god and jesus we thank you that we know you as the god man on earth and you are the son god the son we're so thankful that you are god and you could do what you did for us and holy spirit we praise you that you are God indwelling us and we are safe in your keeping and we are safe to be taught by you and led by you and empowered by you. We trust that you will lead us to please God our Father and to walk as God the Son. How great thou art. You are holy, holy, holy. Thank you for the things that you show us that are three in one that give us the little hints of the greatness that you are as three in one. So help us hold fast to the truth and the glory that you are in the Trinity. We just we thank you for who you are and that you let us know you and that you have revealed so much of yourself to us. Jesus, we pray through you. Amen.